to me, this is more of a prophetic push this morning as it relates to how this message is going to come across. And you can take it as, you know, it's just a word, or you can take it as something that is personalized and tailor-made or something that you really need to partake in. We've been on this 40-day journey, and some of you think it's, it's just something the church is just doing. Um, and some of us really take it as, you know, God is saying something to us individually that requires us to shift how we do things so that we can get the maximum of God. Um, and I hope this is the latter. Uh, we have prayer on Friday night. I encourage you to make at 10 o'clock this Friday again, every Friday, basically except for the last Friday in May. I encourage you to make the effort. And I know you hear it and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I think as a leader, sometimes leaders see things that you don't see. And sometimes they're trying to get you in position before you really need to be in position. And so I want to continue to admonish you of the same. Matthew 12, verse 43 through 45, I'm only going to read two verses. Um, the Pharisees, uh, for context's sake, the Pharisees were asking um, for a sign, and then Jesus basically tells them, you know, only the wicked look for a sign. And verse 43 is where I want to land. It says, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places, dry places, seeking rest and does not find it. Some versions say it goes through waterless places. Verse 44, it says, then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. I want you to look at it and read it again. When an impure spirit comes out of a house, a person, then it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. Father, breathe life to this, that your hearers will be blessed by reading and the teaching of thine holy word. I want you to shout out with all authority, with all voice, protect this house. Somebody say it with me. One, two, three. Protect this house. Here we go. When a spirit leaves a house or a person, it leaves a house, it's unoccupied, it's swept clean. The person did what they needed to do to get this house back in order. It leaves looking for rest, but oftentimes can't find rest. And even though it says that it was evicted from a house, it leaves the house, it still remembers the house it left. So it is possible for you to kick a habit, kick a demon, kick a spirit, and feel like because it has left you, you're safe. Just because you feel safe doesn't mean the spirit doesn't remember the house it left. And so here it is. It's interesting that the spirit, even though it's been moved out, the house has been swept clean, the house has been taken care of, that the spirit still remembers the address that it first left. It doesn't forget because it's been put out. It doesn't forget because it's been moved out. It still has the cognizance enough to understand where it left because here's the thing. The person that swept the house 
kept the house clean, interestingly enough, did what he needed to do to get the house clean. This text doesn't tell us who did the cleaning. It doesn't say God did it or the person did it. It's more actualized that the person did it, trying to do their best to keep their, I'm trying to do my best to get myself together. I'm going to do everything in my power to get myself together. I'm going to do everything that I can do to make sure I'm better. But here's the thing. Moral modification is not regeneration. That does not mean because you try to make yourself moral, you're going to be a new person. What makes you a new person is who inhabits the house. Just because the house has been vacant doesn't mean the house doesn't still have residue. So here it is. When the spirit's in a house, it says this, the house is full of disorder. You can tell which house is being occupied or being influenced because the house is in disorder. A house that's occupied is in disorder. Somebody say it with me. A house that's occupied is in disorder. So when the spirit leaves, there's order in the house. So here's how we can do it on a practical setting. Sometimes we'll see our houses will be a little challenged and other times and stuff like that. And the reason may be is because there may be influences in our house that's causing it to be disorderly. It's no longer a house of peace. It's no longer a house of joy. There's always fussing. There's always arguing. There's always discontent. And we may need to stop and say, who's in this house? Not, not who, who is living or sleeping, but what are the forces that may be in this house that we may not be aware of because the house that's occupied is oftentimes dirty. The house the spirits occupy is dirty. And there's three different types of feelings I like to use. Filled by the spirit, an unoccupied house, influenced by the spirit or occupied by occult spirits filled by the holy spirit an unoccupied house which is neutral influenced or occupied by occult spirits spirits need homes and bodies to live in to be effective that's why you can you can't write laws to kill spirits because they'll just get incarcerated and then jump on another person because they need houses to work in. They need vessels to work through. They just don't move through the air alone. They need vessels and bodies to work through. And everyone who feels like, well, I'm good. I'm, I'm a moral person. I don't do no wrong. I, I don't do this God thing. You're still a candidate to be filled by a demonic spirit because your house is a neutral house and it's looking for houses that it's left that are unoccupied or houses that feel that they can move morally fix themselves and if you and I don't realize that we are not good enough to fix ourselves we will spend our entire time trying to be a savior to ourselves and continually have the same shortcomings because you and I are not strong enough to fill ourselves so here it is it says that who you were is always sending signals to who you are to come back to who you were so you will never become who you're supposed to be. Say it one more time. Who you were is always sending signals to who you are to come back to who you were so you will never become who you're supposed to be. Because remember, the spirit doesn't forget the house that it came from. It just waits until the right season, until the right opportunity, until the right moment. And here's what you understand. The spirit leaves the house. And the text says that it goes through waterless places. It looks for dry and barren and desertous type places to go rest. And this is a very interesting thing because the spirit waits for dry places and so you and I've got to be careful when you and I go through dry seasons all of us will go through dry seasons that when you go through a dry season you are a perfect candidate to be influenced by demonic spirits occult spirits because it looks for dry seasons it looks for the seasons where you go to church but you're not really in church where you hear the word but you're not really of the word it looks for those dry seasons to manifest because it is trying to invade your house and until you get the rational the thinking to say I need to protect my house somebody scream out protect this house so it's important so it says it looks for 
dry seasons. And then it remembers that when it leaves a house and it doesn't have a place to go live, it starts to think of houses that it used to visit. It starts to think of places that it used to visit. Have you ever thought you were delivered from a thing and then all of a sudden you find yourself thinking about the thing that you haven't thought about in a long time because you were delivered from it? Remember, your old self is always sending signals to the new self so the new self will go back to the old self. Don't ever get so caught up in thinking that the old self is so far gone from you that you can never go back to the old self because the old self is always waiting for the right invitation or the right season to come back in. And so here is what this, this man says. Matthew says this. The spirit left the house, but it still refers to the house as my house. So just because I'm not in it, don't mean I don't own it. Let me say it one more time. Just because I'm not in it, doesn't mean I don't own it. Because what happened is the person cleaned his house, but didn't invite the Spirit of God in. Because when you don't invite the Spirit of God in, there's only so long you can stay clean in your own strength. There's only so long you can stay powerful in your own strength. I love his testimony because he said, I got on my knees and I started to pray to God because there has to come a point in the believer's life that they realize if I try to do this in my own strength, I'm going to die trying. If I try to do this in my own power, I'm going to die in my own power. And some of us, need to wake up and recognize the fight that you're fighting is a fight against your house and you're not spiritual enough to discern that you got to protect this house. How you mean to tell me God promoted you, gave you a good season, and now all hell has broken out. And now you telling the person that you built this with that I don't want to be a part of this house anymore because you're not wise enough, you're not discernful enough that you need to protect this house. This is not a house that man has built. It's a house that God has built. And you just can't let anything come and destroy your house. Take advantage of your house. You must protect this house. Somebody screaming out with all lungs, all authority, say protect this house. One, two, three. It is, yeah. So here, here it is. So it's empty. And because the house is empty and it's been swept clean and tidied, when the spirit wants to come back, there's no resistance from the spirit coming back because there's no spirit in there to cause warfare against the spirit coming back in sometimes the warfare you're experiencing in your heart or in your soul is your spirit fighting off old forces trying to inhabit a house that's already been occupied that's why you need to elevate your discernment if you find yourself having a good day having a good week and all of a sudden Satan can't find a way to you he will use your house he will use your children he will use your spouse he will use your family member he will use your cousin in them. He will use your mom in them. And he don't care about you coming to church. He don't care about you having a Bible in your hand. He just wants to fill your house. So if you're not discernful or if you don't take this as God's word to you, you just say, well, that's just a message. But what we're trying to help you understand is God is saying something to you. That if you don't protect your house, he will run your house. And I don't need to be in your house to run your house. I can run your house from the outside. I can cause havoc from the outside. I can cause seeds to be planted in your person's mind that goes in the house. And now they're acting crazy. I ain't in your house, but I'm influencing your house. I ain't a part of your house, but I'm controlling your house. And you got to learn how to put things out that are controlling your house. I don't care how much you love them. I don't care how much history you got with them. I don't care how much of a friendship you got. I don't care how long we've been riding together. I got to protect my house. And I notice every time I'm around you, everything goes wrong in my life. Some of you are loyal to dead things. 
check this out. So here it is. James 1, 26 to 27 says religion is taking care of the widow, looking after the, the poor. But being religious is different. The man or the woman kept their house swept clean and felt like they were good moral people. I'm religious. I, I kind of go to church and I visit and participate and partake. But here's what you got to know. Religion without relationship leads to bondage. Religion without relationship leads to bondage. Have you ever met people who are religious but not Christian? And they swear up and down they know God. They don't know anything about him. They are just religious. They know the songs. They know the music. But they have no connection to God. They know the right things to say. They know all the verses. They know all the text. But they have no relationship with God. And it is possible to go to church week after week and not have a relationship. It is possible to go to church and not have your ears tuned with the Spirit of God. It is possible to be in the house of God, hearing what God is saying, and still not having the Spirit of God with you. And that is why when you are in seasons where your relationship is just religion, it becomes bondage. You don't see things changing. You don't see things moving. Come on, spiritualize what I'm coming for you. You don't see things happening. And here's the thing. The spirit goes and looks for dry, dry places. This is why I've been saying for you, let's come to prayer on Friday. Not because I ain't got nothing to do. Not because we ain't got nothing, nothing else to plan. Here's what the thing is. When water sits still for a long time, it develops bacteria. If you don't cause the water to move back and forth, it becomes stagnant. And here's prophetically what I sense for a lot of us. We're stagnant. Yeah, you got water in you, but it ain't flowing. We're not arguing, do you got water? All of us got water. Yeah, man, I got water. We're not arguing about water. We're arguing about the moving of water. When's the last time you have been in the presence of God and you felt like God was really there? I'm not talking about you prayed and checked it off your list because you're religious. I'm not talking about you sang a song and you checked it off your list because you're religious. I'm talking about the Spirit of God moving to where you left and said, man, I really felt God on that. And because if you don't shake yourself, you will will become stagnant and you will have bacteria in your water and the religion that used to feed you will now make you sick because it's no longer flowing. It is now an exercise of futility. It is now, I went to church, check. I sang on the choir, check. But my life is not seeing the moving of God's spirit. And sometimes you've got to shake yourself. Shaking yourself is an attitude. It is intentional. It is to say, I'm going to make up in my mind that even though I got water, Water. I'm not going to be satisfied with the water that I have. I'm going to shake myself so that more water can come from me and I will not be stagnant. Serving God does not mean you're not stagnant. Being with God and in God's house does not mean you're not stagnant. Some of us are giving God expired worship. And you got to shake yourself. God ain't impressed when you come to church on Sunday morning. Even the demons come on Sunday morning. But I got to shake myself. I got to make myself do things that I don't feel like doing in the natural because I don't want to get stagnant spiritually. The water's got to move. The waters have to move. Here it is. Reformation without occupation leads to a decayed state. Simply means this. If you try to reform yourself, reinvent yourself, but you didn't invite the Spirit of God into yourself, you're going to eventually be a dead self. It's what we have in our world. It's, it's this moralism where everybody feels like, bro, I, when I'm ready to get right, I'm going to go to church. Well, it doesn't work that way. Because if you can get right on your own, this is, what, this is what's happening. You're keeping your house clean for a season. 
and the Spirit of God is coming trying to invite himself in but he finds that you feel like you're a god to yourself and the spirit say well, you know what that's still my house they playing themselves i'm gonna let them go through a season where they're not going to the club where they're not drinking and they're gonna feel like you know what rev i'm delivered it's been three months i ain't did what i used to do but they don't recognize that that house still belongs to the person that vacated it they're just going to look for another spot some of us are satan's vacation home they don't live there every day but when they want to get some real pleasure they know the house to go back and visit when they want to get real excitement they go back to their summer home where they can be loose and they can have no chill and they can have no personality because they know there's no consequences here it is When there's an occupant in the house, it creates a level of warfare because the occupant is not going to let an intruder come into a house that does not belong to them. That's why when you are filled with the Spirit of God, you can't be dual filled with the Spirit of God and then unclean spirits because the two don't coexist. Now, you could be filled with the Spirit of God and influenced by unclean spirits, but you can't be filled. So here it is. Okay. And you may say, you know, I don't believe that. Well, you would have to figure out how to find your way through this scripture in 1 Corinthians 6 that says that um, don't join yourself to a harlot because whom the Lord has purchased is part of the son of God and the daughter. All, all the ones the Lord has purchased belong to the Lord. And, and the word purchase there is the term that they use for buying slaves, that when a slave master buys a slave, nobody can buy that slave back. So it means when God buys you as a believer, purchases you with his blood, can't nobody say, oh, no, you belong to me. You understand what I'm saying? That, and some of you, <laughs> okay, so, okay. No one can enter a house that's occupied unless you invite them in. Y'all ain't said nothing on that. No one can enter a house that's occupied unless you invite them in. They're no longer a stranger, now they're a guest. Y'all ain't talking to me today. All right, so, so, so us who like to get inebriated, okay, that means drunk, okay? That's just, that's just drunk, inebriated. And we like to get filled with other influences. You, you need to be careful because you don't know what your drunken state may invite into your space. You don't know what your drunken space may invite into your life. You don't know what your drunken state may allow you to partake in that you would not have partaken in had you been sober. Here it is. This is good. Okay. Let me say it this way. If you and I don't make Jesus the center of our obsession, Satan will intensify our addiction. If you and I don't make Jesus the center of our obsession, Satan will take our addiction and intensify it. He brings seven spirits with him to make the condition worse than when it first started. Okay. Satan's desire is to micromanage your behavior. You ever been micromanaged from a check when you clock in? Check when you clock out. How long was your lunch? Let me check your talk time. Let's see. How many of you work in the call center world? Let me check your talk time. Make sure you've been talking on the phone. Okay. Uh, 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 how long have you been in the bathroom? Because it seems like you've been in the bathroom a little longer. It's Satan wants to micromanage your life. That is what you call like, I just feel like I'm being harassed. I feel like every step of my life, I'm being harassed. I feel like every decision I make, there's a magnifying glass on it. It just seems like everything that I do, I'm just sitting there wondering about. I'm sitting there puzzled about. I'm sitting there thinking about it. in the late hours. I'm sitting there worried about it. This is what Satan wants to do, micromanage your life. And some of you who are Christian, saved, sanctified, Satan's micromanaging your life because you're basing your life on where you're supposed to be as opposed to where you are. 
and some of your idols is you keep saying, well, I feel like I should be further. I feel like I should be further. We all could be further. That's the truth of the matter. We all could be further. And then you influence your life by what other people are posting online. And half of them are uh, touch brush, airbrushed, and all their type of lives and stuff like that. And so you, you're influencing yourself. And you're saying, well, I should be further. And you're making an idol out of a future that you've never even been in. And so you can't even enjoy the blessings God has given you currently because you're so caught up in what future blessings look like that you keep peeing on what God has given you now. You ain't even happy. And people will trade to have your life, trade to have your car, trade to have your sorrow, trade to have your pain. But you keep coming up with these dumb excuses. I should have more money. Heck, we all should have more money. I should have more joy. Heck, we all should have more joy. But I'm not going to let all of that steal what God has done in my life, is doing in my life. I'm going to learn how to be thankful. I'm going to learn how to rejoice over what I have, over what it is. I'm not going to wait for tomorrow to thank God. I'm going to celebrate him for what I have because when tomorrow gets here, we'll look at tomorrow and say, well, I can't wait till tomorrow, tomorrow, because this isn't good enough. And sometimes we need to learn how to say, Lord, I ain't going to tell you where I should be. You already know I'm just thankful I'm not where I used to be. So here it is. Micromanage your life. Okay, my background is in real estate. And um, you could buy a house, right? But if they don't process the paperwork and give you title, you don't own nothing. And some of you have been advertising a home that you ain't switched ownerships yet. The, the, the keys are in your hand, but the deed is still to the old owner. And so technically, although you live in the house, it's got your furniture in there. It's got your stuff in there. It's got your big screen TV in there, your refrigerator in there. The deed still belongs to the old owner. That's why they can come in when they want. They can tell you what to do. They can tell you how to live because they still have residence in that home. And you got to shake. You got to shake yourself. The thing about it is, the person that cleaned the house couldn't keep the house clean. Let me give you five things about prayer, and then we're gone. This Wednesday, Apostle Anya Hall is coming back. If you, we're going to do a sit-down Q&A. We're going to take all your questions about what spiritual warfare is, because you know what? If you don't know how to fight, you're going to lose every time. you going to lose every time. You're going to lose every time. You're going to lose every time. You're going to lose every time. And you're going to say, oh, I can't do this God thing. Well, when God gives you the tools, you ain't there to get them. Here's five things. I, I look at prayer as an, alarm, as an alarm system. Just to give you a practical way, of course, you know, it's communicating between heaven and earth, all that good stuff. But number one, prayer... It's an alarm system because what do alarm systems do? They alert you. Prayer will help alarm you of what you need to do. So when I did this 40 days of prayer, I heard it first from a pastor, and then this other pastor came and said the same thing. And then I said, well, God, doggone it. If somebody else tells me, then I'll do it. And another person came and started talking about this 40 days of prayer. And then I'm like, all right, well, let me do it. Now, you ain't got to do it. But I'll tell you, if you do do it, you'll see God do some amazing things for you. I won't even tell you. I won't even tell you till the ink is dried about what God is doing. Not from marketing or anything, just from starting 40 days of prayer. If I told you, you would say that is a lie. 
because when you force yourself to do what you don't want to do, you get results that you, when he gets up at 4 a.m., there's a reason why his body doesn't look like mine. Because you sacrifice and you, you force yourself, even though you got things you want to do, you force yourself because you're trying to give yourself a position or perspective from God that you would not get if you just stayed in the bed and watched the Rockets play. Number one, it's not about going to church. I don't want you to miss it. It's about you making the sacrifice to be inconvenienced so that you can get what God is trying to give to you. I am telling you over and over. Some of you have caught the spirit of killing giants to go for a bag, but you have not caught that same spirit for your own soul. Number one, it alarms. Number two, an alarm system, which I parallel to prayer, it protects. There are people that won't come into a house because of a sign secured by ADT. Number three, if someone does enter in a home, the alarm shortens the length of their stay. Prayer shortens the length of trials. Number four, it alerts authority. When my alarm goes off, I don't want you calling my neighbor because they can't help. When my alarm goes off, I don't want you calling my cousin because they can't help. I want you calling the authorities that have the power to make change. And that is what this is about. I'm telling you, by the Spirit of God, that you got to protect your house. Some of the stuff that we're saying, like, oh, you got marital problems. You ain't got marital problems. You just ain't protecting your house. It's not even natural, some of the stuff you're sitting there telling me. It's spiritual. Why are you mad? Oh, we were having a good day. Everything was good. What happened? I don't know. We just started fighting out of nowhere. Nobody popped up and said, you know what, I don't think this is natural. I think this is spiritual. Oh, that's too deep. It ain't that deep when you're in divorce court. Like, if we want to just go to church and just be one of the church that we high-five each other and say, boy, we had good church, but then we're miserable, life stinks, everything is bad, our lives are so bad, we become Orlando Magic fans. I mean, this is the type of life that you don't, you don't want to live, right? So you got to shake yourself. You got to shake yourself so you don't get stagnant. From leader to people, you, you got to shake yourself so you don't get to a place where you are so comfortable that you don't realize that God has outgrown you. You understand know what I'm saying? Like, you can't outgrow God, but God can outgrow you. Like, man, you've been at this same level for, it's just boring talking to you now. Every time you pray to me, it's the same thing. It's like, I thought you'd graduate by now. You ever been single and you're like, man, I just thought the dating pool would be so much better. Like, people's cognizance would be a lot higher. And when I talk to them, I realize I'm better off being single. Kind of the same thing God is saying. Like, I talked to you and I thought your life would be better, but you're still the same miserable Christian that I saved 10 years ago. I haven't done anything to see you grow. I haven't seen you become better. You're, the same, you're praying the same way you prayed. You're giving me the same type of love you give me. You don't make no sacrifice for me, but you want me to break down and do all the sacrifices for you. I thought our relationship would have grown to a deeper place than this and I'm done because y'all look real mad and angry Father I've said what you've asked me to say I pray that it is used for the advancement of your house and your children at the end of the day we want your people to be a reflection of your goodness a reflection of your love a reflection of your power